On February 11, the spray rounded Cape Virgins and entered the Strait of Magellan. The scene was again real and gloomy. The wind northeast and blowing a gale sent feather white spume along the coast. Such a sea ran as would swamp an ill appointed ship. As the sloop neared the entrance to the strait, I observed that two great tide races made ahead, one very close to the point of the land and one farther offshore. Between the two, in a sort of channel through comas, went the spray with close reefed sails. But a rolling sea followed her a long way in, and a fierce current swept around the cape against her. But this she stemmed, and was soon chirruping under the lee of Cape Virgins, and running every minute into smoother water. However, long trailing kelp from sunken rocks waved forebodingly under her keel, and the wreck of a great steamship smashed on the beach abreast gave a gloomy aspect to the scene. I was not to be let off easy. The virgins would collect tribute even from the spray passing their promontory. Fitful rain squalls from the northwest followed the northeast gale. I reefed the sloop's sails, and sitting in the cabin to rest my eyes, I was so strongly impressed with what in all nature I might expect, that as I dozed, the very air I breathed seemed to warn me of danger. My senses heard spray ahoy shouted in warning. I sprang to the deck, wondering who could be there that knew the spray so well as to call out her name passing in the dark, for it was now the blackest of nights all around, except away in the southwest, where the old familiar white arch, the terror of Cape Horn, rapidly pushed up by a southwest gale. I had only a moment to douse sail and lash all solid when it struck like a shot from a cannon, and for the first half hour it was something to be remembered by way of a gale. For thirty hours it kept on blowing hard. The sloop could carry no more than a three-reefed mainsail and four staysail. With these she held on stoutly and was not blown out of the strait. In the height of the squalls in this gale she doused all sail and this occurred often enough. After this gale followed only a smart breeze and the spray, passing through the narrows without mishap, cast anchor at Sandy Point on February 14, 1896. Sandy Point, or Punta Arenas, is a Chilean coaling station and boasts about 2,000 inhabitants of mixed nationality, but mostly Chileans. What with sheep farming, gold mining and hunting, the settlers in this dreary land seemed not the worst off in the world. But the natives, Patagonian and Fuegian, on the other hand, were as squalid as contact with unscrupulous traders could make them. A large percentage of the business there was traffic in fire water. If there was a law against selling the poisonous stuff to the natives, it was not enforced. Fine specimens of the Patagonian race, looking smart in the morning when they came into town, had repented before night of ever having seen a white man. So beastly drunk were they, to say nothing about the peltry of which they had been robbed. The port at that time was free, but a custom house was in course of construction, and when it is finished, port and tariff dues are to be collected. A soldier police guarded the place, and a sort of vigilante force besides took down its guns now and then. 
but as a general thing to my mind, whenever an execution was made, they killed the wrong man. Just previous to my arrival, the governor, himself of a jovial turn of mind, had sent a party of young bloods to foray a Fuegian settlement and wipe out what they could of it on account of the recent massacre of a schooner's crew somewhere else. Altogether, the place was quite newsy and supported two papers, dailies, I think. The port captain, a Chilean naval officer, advised me to ship hands to fight Indians in the strait farther west, and spoke of my stopping until a gunboat should be going through, which would give me a tow. After canvassing the place, however, I found only one man willing to embark, and he on condition that I should ship another Mon and a Doog. But as no one else was willing to come along, and as I drew the line at dogs, I said no more about the matter, but simply loaded my guns. At this point in my dilemma, Captain Pedro Samblich, a good Austrian of large experience, coming along, gave me a bag of carpet tacks, worth more than all the fighting men and dogs of Tierra del Fuego. I protested that I had no use for carpet tacks on board. Samblich smiled at my want of experience, and maintained stoutly that I would have use for them. You must use them with discretion, he said. That is to say, don't step on them yourself. With this remote hint about the use of tacks, I got on all right, and saw the way to maintain clear decks at night, without the care of watching. Samblik was greatly interested in my voyage, and after giving me the tax, he put on board bags of biscuits and a large quantity of smoked venison. He declared that my bread, which was ordinary sea biscuits and easily broken, was not nutritious as his, which was so hard that I could break it only with a stout blow from a maul. Then he gave me from his own sloop a compass, which was certainly better than mine, and offered to unbend her mainsail for me if I would accept it. Last of all, this large-hearted man brought out a bottle of Fuegian gold dust from a place where it had been cached, and begged me to help myself from it for use farther along on the voyage. But I felt sure of success without this draft on a friend, and I was right. Samblik's tacks, as it turned out, were of more value than gold.